Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Tuesday, August 27th. The American citizen deserves to know who's trying to influence them. Why the nation's top election enforcement, enforcement official is sounding the alarm about 2020 and the sudden lack of ability to investigate foreign influence. How the increased use of scooters might impact poor and underserved communities. I think they make great pets. And animal rescuers are taking in an increasing number of stray chickens and roosters around the city. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. Here's some of what's making news in Chicago tonight. The mayor and police superintendent say their crime fighting tactics are showing promise in Chicago. Today, the mayor told reporters that shootings in the city are down 12% since last year, the lowest since 2014, and murders are down 15% since last year, the lowest since 2015. Additionally, she says that robberies, burglaries, and motor vehicle thefts are at a 20 year low citywide. And the city is on pace to recover more than 10,000 illegal guns by the end of the year. We're very intentional about the work that we've been doing, particularly on not just a week by week basis, but a really a day by day basis. Um, the superintendent is in tight contact with the deputy chiefs and district commanders about what's happening on a day by day basis. We know based upon a lot of data and analysis where the um, trouble spots are. We're making sure that we're putting resources there. Mayor Lightfoot will give her State of the City address later this week, and you can get live coverage of that event co-hosted by our Paris Shuts and WBEZ's Becky Vivi at 6 p.m. Thursday right here on WTTW and WTTW.com, as well as Facebook, YouTube, and a live simulcast on 91.5 WBEZ. Tens of thousands of people with arrests and convictions related to marijuana will see their records cleared of those charges under a new program announced by Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox and nonprofit technology nonprofit Code for America. The group says it will provide Cook County with the digital system at no cost to taxpayers to analyze digitized records, identify the people eligible for expungement, and produce a court-ready record all in a fraction of the time it would take attorneys to do it research has found is that people who have been eligible for this type of relief, only about three to five percent of them actively work to get those convictions vacated, largely because the, the, the process is so onerous, people don't know how to do it. So the unique part about this is that we are doing this on behalf of those who have had these convictions without them having to petition us to do that in the first place. And Fox says her office is working with state police to determine exactly how many conviction records the county must process. In Illinois, about 770,000 arrests and convictions must be automatically expunged over the next five years. And you can read more about this story on our website. A teacher's license to teach can immediately be suspended if they're charged with certain crimes like sex crimes or drug offenses under a new law. It's designed to increase student safety and prevent educators from finding jobs at one school district while under investigation at another. The State Board of Education says previously it had to wait until an educator's criminal case had completed before suspending his or her license. Under the new law, it can be reinstated if the person is acquitted. It also increases the frequency of background checks for employees to every five years versus only when the employee is hired. As for the weather tonight, mostly clear with a low around 59. Then tomorrow, kind of like today, but cooler with a high near 74 and mostly sunny. Federal authorities have repeatedly sounded the alarm about foreign influence in the United States elections, and their expectation is that Russia and possibly other actors are gearing up to do it again in 2020. But a core federal agency that keeps watch on elections is suddenly without any enforcement ability. The head of that agency is in Chicago today, and Paris Schutz caught up with her. Paris, what'd you hear? Brandis, she is Ellen Weintraub. She's the head of the Federal Election Commission. So that's the agency that enforces all the nation's campaign finance laws. So if someone running for federal office violates those laws, say, accepts foreign money, then the FEC investigates and enforces fines. So the agency is supposed to have six commissioners. They've been running well 
short of that for many years. And now another commissioner announced his resignation this week. So they are down to three. That is one short of a quorum. That means they need to have at least four to be able to enforce any campaign finance laws or take any official action. So which, with three, they cannot do any of that. So Weintraub says it should concern anybody who wants to feel confident in the integrity of the coming elections. But she does say the agency will still try to monitor campaigns. I am concerned about what will happen in enforcement. Obviously, we, we will continue to investigate the matters that have been um, previously authorized for investigation, but we won't be able to resolve any of them. So no one should be under the uh, delusion that they can just get away with anything right now. They're the, there's a long statute of limitations, and uh, we're not going to throw these complaints in the, in the trash because they come in at a time when we don't have a quorum. So, Paris, what does this mean then for the potential policing foreign influence in the 2020 election? It certainly doesn't bode well right now, Brandis, especially given the repeated intelligence assertions that Russia is geared up to try and influence the 2020 presidential election. And add to this the complicated web out there of PACs, super PACs, 501c3 organizations, 501c4s. Those 501c4s are the so-called dark money groups, so they don't have to report where their money goes. And that means foreign actors can get around the law and route their money to try and influence a campaign one way or the other. And the FEC has no ability right now to police it. If indeed a Russian banker were trying to influence our elections, were trying to funnel money, I don't think he would do it by writing a big check on the Central Bank of Moscow and um, mailing it and, you know, signing his name with a flourish and mailing it over to a group that's active in our elections. I think he'd try and hide it. He'd try and hide it through various entities, the way we've seen domestic players sometimes try and hide the money by funneling it through, as I said, LLCs, C4s, all sorts of organizations. And we've seen folks who have gone to great lengths to try and hide the source of the money that's being spent in our elections. So I think that it was incumbent upon an entity that has subpoena authority and has the tools to do a thorough investigation to get to the bottom of that and to get to the bottom of any other um, allegations that may arise. In fact, uh, Chair Weintraub says she didn't attempt to have the FEC investigate something like that. There was a report from the McClatchy News Service that the FBI was looking into a big uh, Russian-connected donation to the NRA that they thought might be uh, funneled to the Trump campaign. Weintraub tried to get the commissioners to have the FEC investigate it. She said the Republican commissioners on that staff. She is a Democrat. There are Democrat and Republican commissioners. She said the Republican commissioners on that staff uh, said no to it and they voted it down. The allegation itself was so important uh, and so fundamental to the integrity of our system, the notion that the Russians might have been funneling potentially millions of dollars through a U.S. organization into, a political, uh, uh, into the political arena trying to influence our elections, um, that is really a blockbuster allegation. And we should have looked into it merely because it was so important and we need to put it to rest one way or the other. And this current situation at the FEC is raising alarm bells from watchdogs across the country. Brandis, a former Republican member of the FEC who now heads a group called the Campaign Legal Center, issued a statement saying, quote, President Trump and the U.S. Senate should treat this resignation as an emergency and agree on the nomination and confirmation of a new slate of FEC commissioners who are qualified for the job and committed to enforcing our nation's election laws. Without a functioning election watchdog, the vulnerabilities in U.S. elections that were exposed in 2016 by Russia will be exploited to greater effect by foreign and domestic actors in the 2020 election and beyond. The public's right to fair and transparent elections is at stake. In Paris, why haven't the vacancies been filled? Well, commissioner has to be nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate. So President Trump in 2017 did nominate somebody. The Senate has yet to hold any confirmation hearings on anybody. Now, we reached out to both Illinois U.S. senators. They were not available for comment today. All right, Paris, thank you. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. 
scooters represent the clearest visual examples of the disruption seeding a tectonic shift in the transportation sector in Chicago. Those are the words of our next guest who says the city and the world are on the brink of a transportation revolution and he wants to ensure the benefits of that revolution reach and are shared equally by communities of color. Joining us now to explain what he means by that is Olatunji Oba, Oba, he told me, Obai Reed, president and CEO of Equiticity, a Chicago-based group that advocates for racial equity. Reed is also co-founder of Slow Roll Chicago, which promotes bicycle use on the south and west sides. Obai, welcome to Chicago tonight. Thank you. Thank so you for having me. In your op-ed in Cranes, you zeroed in on the issue of scooters, but really as a means of looking at the whole issue of race, equity, and mobility in Chicago. How do you view scooters in this broader picture? Sure, scooters are one tool in our mobility toolkit. We are advocating for increased mobility in black and brown neighborhoods because increased mobility in our neighborhoods will be transformative for our neighborhoods. And we want people in our neighborhoods, people of color, black and brown people, to enjoy the benefits of increased mobility. So we support scooters as much as we support dockless bikes, as much as we support public transit, as much as we, we support shared mobility. We see scooters as a part of the bigger picture around ensuring that there's racially equitable distribution of mobility resources in our city. Your op-ed was titled, Scooters in an unjust, unjust City. There's a war in our streets and we don't even know it. What is the war you're referring to there? The war is so many people fighting for control of our streets. And the people who live in these neighborhoods are, are, are completely unaware that there's a war going on to control our streets. Uh, bureaucrats at City Hall want to control our streets. Uh, scooter manufacturers want to control our streets. Uh, dockless bike share systems want to control our streets. Developers want to control our streets. And our position is the ownership of our streets belong to the people who live in the neighborhoods where these streets are, are stationed. We should be controlling our streets. We should be in a leadership position defining and executing and bringing these mobility services into our neighborhoods and onto our streets, not people who don't live in our streets and who don't understand our needs. And exactly what impact is it that you think or that you're concerned about scooters having in black and brown communities? Sure. So the way scooters could potentially harm our neighborhoods as a couple of ways. One, should um, increase scooter ridership have an adverse impact on public transit in Chicago CTA and that adverse impact on public transit results in, um, you know, budget shortfalls at CTA, which could result in uh, higher fares or uh, service cuts. And the people in Chicago who are the most dependent on public transit in our city are black and brown people, south side and west side. So that's one example. The other is should increase scooter ridership or should the benefits accrue only to predominantly white, middle to upper income neighborhoods, mostly on the north side, then uh, what we'll see is white people enjoying the benefits of increased mobility in, our, in, in those neighborhoods and black and brown people are not seeing those benefits. So what you will have is an increase of inequities, an increase of disparities between black and brown people and white people. And why, do you, why is it that you think that the take up rate or the number of people who will be using these scooters in black and brown communities would be less? Structural racism. Uh, existing inequities in our society. Um, we're concerned about violence in, on the south and west side, not simply interpersonal violence. We're concerned about traffic violence and we're concerned about police violence. Um, the lack of safe, secure infrastructure that allows people in our neighborhoods to feel comfortable riding on the street and, and having a barrier protected bicycle slash scooter lane to help them feel safe and secure riding on the street. A lack of uh, bicycle culture in our neighborhoods where people in our neighborhoods are not so used to seeing cyclists in our neighborhoods and, and sometimes are even uh, actively antagonistic around the activity of cycling in our neighborhoods. Um, those are just a few of the reasons that unless there's deliberate intentional efforts and strategies to ensure 
that mobility is being increased in our neighborhoods and the resources and the resources are there to ensure that people are engaging in this activity, we'll certainly see mobility increase in predominantly white neighborhoods and it stay the same or decrease in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. And what impact do you think violence and policing will have on the use of scooters in black and brown neighborhoods? Well, we know that there's been a pattern of racial inequity at the Chicago Police Department. Um, the Chicago Tribune, uh, you know, detailed this in the Biking While Black series, uh, you know, as of two years ago. They, they did it, you know, once a year for two years. Um, and we saw that black and brown people were being targeted um, by the police for minor infractions on the south and west side that were, and, and white people were not being targeted for those same infractions on the north side. And should that pattern continue and accrue to scooter riders, we'll see the same thing. The reason black and brown people are not riding scooters on the street is because they don't feel safe riding on the street. And should they ride on the sidewalk as a form of, you know, exercising their right around mobility and be targeted by the police, that's going to discourage people from engaging in that activity. That's going to dis discourage people who are living in and in, in, in working in our neighborhoods from exercising their right around increased mobility. And that would be, that would be harmful in our neighborhoods. And you've written extensively about what it is that you would like to see uh, the city policymakers do to address some of the transportation and mobility equity issues. What what are some of those? Sure. So first, we um, we recommend that the mayor adopt the equity racial equity statement of principle. With that statement, we define, we envision, and we describe the guiding principles around racial equity. We also recommend that they that the, the city, the mayor, adopt the untokening principles of mobility justice. These are principles, principles that operate at the intersection of mobility and enforcement to ensure that we're conscious around these issues for black and brown people because it's not the same for predominantly white neighborhoods when we talk about where mobility and enforcement are inextricably linked. And then we talked about the, the, the necessity for the city of Chicago to uh, uh, create policy and eventually pass racial equity legislation. So um, we're not at the whim of a DOT commissioner. We're not at the whim of a mayor that this legislation is baked, it's formulaic, it's mathematical, and it's clear around how we operationalize racial equity in our city. Obai Reed from Equiticity, thank you so much for joining us. The pleasure is mine, thank you. So you've heard about adopting dogs and cats from the pound, but there's a new phenomenon. Stray chickens and roosters are being rounded up around the city by Chicago Animal Care and Control, as well as by a couple of other nonprofit rescue groups who are helping these victims of foul play. He's really pretty. He is pretty. We are been, we've been calling him Angelo. Angelo? Yeah. Angelo. It's a busy day at Chicago Chicken Rescue, where a number of chickens are going to their forever homes. Jamie has brought her mom to pick up the newest birds she's adding to her flock at their Lucky 7 farm. Here at Chicago Chicken Rescue, Christina and her husband Vincent created a nonprofit sanctuary for a variety of domestic birds. We get mostly chickens, mostly roosters specifically. Um, we also get peacocks, we get ducks, we have one turkey. They're often coming in injured. Rescuers say there's been an uptick in abandoned birds in Chicago over the last two years, and some think it's related to the boom in backyard chicken keeping. In areas such as Logan Square, we're seeing a lot of dumped birds, and I think what happens is people get them, they don't know what they're getting into. People are dumping them in the forest preserves around the city. The rescuers also say that schools are adding to the problem when they hatch eggs without a plan for the chicks. So this is Kelso. A lot of people get them as babies, think that they're hens, and then they end up as roosters. A lot of people don't know is that hens will only lay eggs typically for a few years. It takes a village of volunteers, vets, foster homes, adopters, and sanctuaries to save these dumped animals. 14-year-old Chicago Chicken Rescue volunteer Goodwin Lane has been helping at the nonprofit for two years. Our main goal and our main focus is to find them good homes. Chicago Chicken Rescue, along with Chicago Roo Crew and Animal Care and Control, were pushed to their limits in June when more than 100 chickens and roosters were rescued from a cockfighting ring in West Englewood. I went there, my ward superintendent uh, joined me 
And as we looked inside, just a crack in the wall, you could see that it was cages upon cages. I got the call from Alderman Lopez's office, so we immediately sent our animal control inspectors out to investigate along with um, Chicago police. And as the hours progressed throughout the night, the numbers kept increasing. And that's when we started a little bit of panic mode. The first day we had 80 birds and it was so loud. <laughs> I took five of the sickest tens to an emergency vet. Many uh, municipal shelters in the same situation would have euthanized the roosters. I took one look at them and I felt terribly, terribly sorry for them and I thought, we as a society owe them a second chance. All of the 114 birds were placed in homes and sanctuaries across the country in about four weeks. The owner of the house is facing a number of charges. This is the second time he's been busted for cockfighting and animal cruelty. Alderman Raymond Lopez thinks it's time for Chicago to consider whether farm animals belong in the city. And I don't think people should think that I'm just 100% against farm animals. Yeah. Our roosters are, they, they have a very beautiful song that they sing during the day. They go in at night, so there's not noise during the night. People misunderstand and fear them. They think that they're <laughs> loud, and they think that they're uh, <laughs> you know, unfriendly or something. Currently, there are no restrictions for owning roosters and chickens in Chicago. But after the cockfighting bust, Alderman Lopez thinks the city should consider rules. I think when it comes to the farm animals, we have to start regulating them, but also making sure that community input is taken into consideration, much in the same fashion as we do when someone is trying to do a zoning change or apply for a liquor license, because the community ultimately will be impacted by if there's roosters going in the morning. Sanctuaries such as Chicago Chicken Rescue should not be policed in the same way as people who are dumping backyard birds. So it's hard to envision regulation that would curtail the one without harming the other. So can chickens coexist with the city environment and neighbors? I think they make great pets. She'll take naps with me and cuddle. Chickens really love to like follow you around and see what's going on. Rescue workers and animal advocates agree if you can't manage any animal you've taken in, seek help finding it another home. Please don't dump that animal in the public way. Please come to Chicago Animal Care and Control or call 311 for help. And the man who was arrested for owning and running the cockfighting ring was charged with animal torture, aggravated cruelty to animals, and owning an animal for sport, and will be arraigned on those felony counts this week. Chicago Chicken Rescue currently has about 65 birds ready for adoption. If you want to learn more about it or Chicago Roo Crew, you can head to our website. And that's our show for this Tuesday night, abbreviated to bring you special pledge programming. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson on his kidney donation by his son. And an update on where Chicago's last waterfall flowed more than a year ago. And we leave you tonight with a little toe-tapping music from world-renowned guitarist George Freeman and blues harpist Billy Branch, along with other great musicians rehearsing for their performance at the Chicago Jazz Festival this Friday. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984. Welcome to this edition of Chicago Tonight. I'm Gene Honda along with Colleen Crimmins. Hi. Why do you watch Chicago Tonight? Well, because you're trying to find out more about what's going on in your city. Exactly. And you're trying to find out details 
behind what you get from some of the other news programs. Whether it's Chicago or the world, that's why you're watching WTTW right now. Well, please lend your support for more information to be able to make better decisions. Yep, I mean, it's a journalistic institution. It's been on the air for 35 years, always has top-notch correspondence, and that's why you're a viewer. We're so grateful that you're here. We have some exciting news. Gene, do you want to tell them about the meet and greet Sure. Coming up? One of the things that's great about the people you're watching here on Chicago Tonight is you sort of uh, enjoy them, you're used to them. They're friends that come into your home. Why don't you come into their home? How would you like to meet all the people from Chicago Tonight? We have an opportunity for you to join them, to talk with them, to see them in person. Come and join us here at WTTW on Friday, September 20th at 5 p.m. for $100 you'll have the chance to meet, greet, and talk with some of the people who you rely upon for daily Chicago mm -hmm. information. You'll get to see the studio. You get to see where Phil and company actually work. We have refreshments, we have hors d'oeuvres, but more importantly, we have a chance for you to be able to meet some of the people who come into your house. Exactly. Carol Marin is going to be there, Paris Schutz, Amanda Vinicki, and uh, you can be up close and personal with some of your favorite journalists. It's an exciting evening, but Jean, if they can't make it, let's let our viewers know that your support is critical to our ongoing excellence in um, public broadcasting and specifically current events. So if you can't make it, call us anyway. Use the number on your screen or use our secure website, WTTW.com. Donate what Ever you can so that we can ensure Chicago Tonight is on for another 35 years. Yeah, the people you count on are also counting on you. So call yeah. the number that you see on your screen. Call us at 773-588-1111 because uh, the, you're not the only person who watches Chicago Tonight. We still need your support. And that means you need to be there. Join us on September the 20th. For $100, you'll be able to go. But it's not that big of a studio. So you're going to have to reserve your spot really quickly. Absolutely. And bring a friend. $200, the two of you are going. There's going to be a great panel discussion after the meet and greet. You'll be having your refreshment, enjoying your hors d'oeuvres, and take part in a panel discussion about politics. What else? So it's a very, very interesting and fun evening. We hope you will be there. But you've got to connect with us right now to get your ticket. And thank you for watching Chicago Tonight.